It's the lens, it's the lens, it's the lens, gotta live diverse. It's the lens, it's the lens, it's the lens, live diverse. Hello, everybody. You are listening to The Lens Living Diverse, a podcast which gives individuals with sight loss and other identities the opportunity to speak about the unique experiences about many 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 different topics and today i will be your host ben i am uh, the advocacy accessibility and community engagement guy i hope you all know me by now and today we have a really awesome episode we got we got a wonderful guest in Ali, and we are going to be talking about racialized masculinity and just all the factors and have like a nice, candid conversation. Uh, so Ali, how are you doing, my friend? Hey, Ben, how is everyone? Thanks for having me. I'm doing great. Oh, it's a pleasure, man. I know uh, we first met at the Accessibility Roundtable, and I knew I had to get you on the episode. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Anytime, my friend. Anytime. So, yeah, before we get started on a a nice little conversation, I would just like to ask you to to introduce yourself to the audience. Tell about your your experiences and your identity. Um, so yeah, so I'm 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 Ali Khalil. I I you know, I I work here at the CNIB as a program lead of uh, Come to Work Alberta. Um, I've been uh, I I've been a, I've been visually impaired since I was about seven. Um, When I, you know, it happened so fast. I, it was in a span of a week where I I noticed my, my vision was getting worse to the point where my teachers start noticing it. And back in the day, you used to write your, uh, your homework and your agenda and, and all that. And it reached a point where I was right at the board and I was, you know, writing and I was still having a tough time and so you know my 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 teacher uh called my my parents I went and seen the doctor and you know it took a while for them to figure out what was uh what my condition was uh but at that time they said I was declared legally blind and I lost about 75 to 80 percent of um my um central vision oh wow it that was that was just quick it just happened eh it just happened because um, it was genetics, right? It, it my, you know, I, I come from a big family, uh, you know, seven sisters, one brother. Mm. All seven of my sisters have 2020 vision. Me and my brother are the only ones from the family that have um, star guards. Mm. And my brother, it, w- it, it was um, at birth, they knew that he was visually impaired. I, I was, it hit me when I was about seven years old at school. Um, and uh, yeah, I remember, I, I can't, you know, remember having 2020 vision, like I had, I was able to, to see it, but it, it, it's been so long now, it's been over, you know, 20 plus years, and, and I can't recall it. But yeah, when I was seven, I still remember that week, like it was yesterday, actually, because that's like, that, that it's just something that was so traumatic, it just, you, you just, you never forget it, because that's when your, your, your life changed, right? You, you had to uh, relearn everything, adapt, find new tips and tricks to, to navigate the world at large, right? So, yeah. yeah. And I, I totally feel you, because even with myself, having RP, mine was acquired. And when I was younger, I, I didn't even know I was visually impaired. Like, I was told by a doctor, but because I was still running around and catching a football and playing basketball, I was like, Nah, really? Like, <laughs> I don't think I am, right? So I, I, I could uh, see where you're coming from for sure. Yeah, and you're always constantly in denial. Like, I remember it was such a tough pill to swallow. I'm not gonna sit here and say like, oh yeah, I coped with it overnight. It, I tried to um, hide from the world that I had a disability for for you know when I was in junior high and in high school. It wasn't until you know. Um, life slapped me in the face and I had to wake up and do something about it and uh, mm. it was just going through certain experiences where I reached a point where you know life is life doesn't happen nothing is given to you on a silver platter you got to work mm. for it and, and and that was a a tough lesson I had to learn right after high school so oh very true very true so even to ask you like your relations of your other identities with your sight loss how was that like if you could tell us about your your other identities yeah so you know um uh it's a bit different so you know my parents uh 
uh, grew up in Lebanon. And in the late 70s, they immigrated here to Canada mm. to give me and my, 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 my siblings um, a better life, right? But there was just a lot of things that, you know, like I identify with the Arab, Arab culture and the Lebanese culture, and then there's the, the Western culture, right? And, and I, at first, it was, you know, what, what, what separates the two is I always say, like, one made me strong, the other gave me opportunity. Mm. Um, and with, with like the Arab culture, you know, it's not like here in Canada, like in Lebanon, people are very direct. Oh, you're visually impaired. What can you see? How much money do you make? Like things that, you know, if you asked any random question, any random person here in Canada, they would find offensive. Yeah. Uh, they, they would take a, a f- offense to it. So uh, there, like when I was in Lebanon and I, you know, I was visually impaired, my, my people made it, made me feel like I was, I was, disabled they you know they would come up to me and put their fingers in my face and, and things like that and and you know it, I'm not gonna sit here and lie you know I, I was kind of it, it hurt you know it was, mm-hmm. people wouldn't play soccer with me you know because they thought I was gonna get hurt they didn't want to be responsible and you knew like the kids wanted me to play but their parents would tell them this was in Lebanon that oh mm-hmm. no like if something happens to him you're gonna get blamed and then I remember like I went to school in Lebanon and uh, my cousins, my older cousins would, would come to my house and they wouldn't let me walk alone because they, they, they thought I couldn't, I wasn't able to. Um, and it's, it's so interesting because you have here in Canada where that's almost seen as like, we, we look for inclusivity and then you have back in Lebanon, as you were making mentions, like, no, he, he doesn't belong. And as blunt as it is, it's, that's just the way it is. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, 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 it is. And, 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 and you know what, like, my parents are from a small village, you know what I mean? Not mm-hmm. every like 90% of them are not educated. So now as, as I get older, I understand it's just that's, that's just their norms. Back in my uh, country, parents country of Ghana, it was exactly like that. Like people would wave their hand in your face and that'd be normal. And here it's considered like bullying. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 uh, but you know what I mean? It's, it, it, and that's where identifying with two cultures, you got to learn how to adapt and switch between, between them. Right. Um, because like when I came back from Lebanon, like the year I found out I was legally blind, um, Right after I, I was a year and I was here, I was doing school here in Canada in Calgary, sorry. And then my parents wanted to move to Lebanon for me to learn Arabic for a couple of years. It's just a very common theme mm-hmm. in the Arab culture to go back to your home country and, and allow your kids to learn the, the uh, Arabic language. And so I went there for about a year and a half, but I had no accommodations, you know what I mean, in school. Um, and it was really hard because like they took me back a grade. Um, mm. and that affected me when I came to Canada because I, I, I was, I had to start for, I was actually in grade two, but I had to start back from grade one again, because you know what I mean? They didn't know how to accommodate me instead of trying to accommodate me. They just said, oh no, he's not ready for grade two. Mm. They took me back to grade one. Yeah, and that- I remember that. And then when I came back to Canada, did, you know, I told my mom, I like, can, can you, you know, can I get can I be put in grade two? And there was nothing they can do because the mm-hmm. records that were from Lebanon that we used showed that I was um, in uh, grade one. And so they wouldn't let me um, go to the, uh, they wouldn't let me, uh, uh, they wouldn't let me in grade two. So I had to s- stay in uh, redo mm-hmm. grade one again. Yeah. And um, that, that hurt um, because I was held back a year. I remember that. And then mm-hmm. um This is why, and then when I go back to what I said that, you know, Canada, you know, the the Canadian culture gave me opportunity because my teachers, they, they really tried to help me and they tried to accommodate me. They reached out to, you know, the, 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 the Calgary board of education, they reached out to CNIB, people that knew what to do and, and, and how to help me. You know, I remember one of the biggest things, like my teacher cried because, I would take a small book and I'm like, look, I'm going to read this big chapter book. And she would take it away from me. And she's like, no, because she knew like at the time, I'm like, why is she doing this to me? But they were just waiting for those bigger, those larger books to come in for it, for me to be able to read it. 
uh, physically. And so, you know what I mean? At first I took offense to, I'm like, why wouldn't she let me read this book? But they were just looking out for me. Like, this is going to be tough and it's going to be straining on the eyes. It's going to give yeah. me a headache. But this was the first time going from Lebanon, like where there was no accommodations and like wrote me off and sent me back to grade one. But when I came back to Canada, this is where they got every, all the right parties involved. And this is where, you know, I felt accommodated. You know what yeah. I mean? Like there was, there was a lot of things, but then there was limitations because then as I grew, as I, I start, you know, um, going to grade three and grade four and grade five, there's certain discussions that were being, that were, 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 that teachers were having with me that, you know, pretty much like stay in your lane and don't mm. go out of oh, your comfort circle. So and I, so. and I remember I was 13 yeah. I'm not going to lie to you. And this is why I say like the Arab culture made me strong. Yeah. I remember my dad refused to, you know, he refused to, to admit that his, his two sons had vision loss. Mm. Right? It, it just, he, it just was such a blow to his pride at the time. And uh, he, he just, he'd be like, no, go get a job. And so when yeah. I turned 14, he's like, no, go get a job, like follow your friends, just don't let it get the best. He just wouldn't believe it. He's like, no, you could do whatever yeah. uh, a sighted person can do. So even with that said, uh, wow, powerful story for sure. With that said, uh, though, looking at your gender as being a male uh, and racialized as well and part of like the, the Muslim culture, do you think that it was almost more of a sense of like masculinity like pushed on you compared to a, a person maybe who's just a white person? Yeah, I would say that. Like my dad, you know, in, in the Arab culture, there's like a checklist of that you have to check off in life if you're, you're, if you're a boy or a man mm-hmm. to, 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 to claim that status, I'm a man. You know, like, you know, going to graduating uh, high school, going to post-secondary you know, getting your degree, finding a good job, getting married, buying a house and having kids. Like once you've checked all those boxes, you're a man. Right. And then like my dad, I knew my dad, he loved me. He was just trying to motivate me. But at the same time, there was still like that. No, you're a man. Mm -hmm. Like he, he said, go, go get a job. Not. And, and I was saying to my dad at the time, like, you know, I, that, like, I can't see the application stuff. He's like, no, follow your friends and stuff. You know, he told me, but there was no, like, he didn't, there was no actions to his words. Like he just told me to do it, but it made me strong. Like I, it was a lesson I need, I needed to learn at a young age. And it it made me into the person I am today, but I followed my friends, you know, you network, right. To get that opportunity. And I remember my, my friends were all applying to the saddle, the home Mm -hmm. of the flames. And my Mm -hmm. friends, you know, knew I was visually impaired and they helped me with the application. And so the only thing I told them not to check off was, you know, uh, ca- or to check off was cashier that I wasn't able to do it. Yeah. And then I got the job. That was my first job. And it was, it was, it was in 04. It was yeah. when the flames were, were, were killing it. They were, you know, they, they made it all the way to the very end. They almost won, won the cup, but you know, I, I, I got to admit, I'm more of an Oilers fan. So I'm, I'm... fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> you know, that's, a, that's another discussion for another day. But, I worked that whole season and I helped in the concession stands and stuff. And I was able to do it without disclosing my disability. Mm. But honestly, if I didn't learn that lesson, it just, I wouldn't be able to advocate for myself. That was like one of the biggest things my dad um, taught me is that, you know, like life, you know, life, you know, nothing's given to you in this life Mm -hmm. and nothing, nothing, you're, you're, you're not given anything on a silver platter you know, you want something done, do it yourself because you can't rely on everyone. Like people support you. People will guide you mm. at the end of the day. It's how, it's how much you want it. Exactly. Um, and I, I totally can get what you're saying, brother. Like even me as a, a male as well, black male entrenched in the, the Ghana culture with my parents, that whole thing where it's a de- double edged sword. I like to say where, it instills that toughness in you, but then at the same time, you have these expectations of what a real man is like, like what a real man is like. So I remember even like playing sports with my, my brothers 
And I don't know, I'd get hit in the face with a football or basketball because of my sight loss. I didn't, I didn't see it coming. Right. Yeah. Even though like sometimes I'd catch it, sometimes I wouldn't. Right. And getting hit, knocked, fall to the floor. And as a, as a man, you're not supposed to cry. You know what I mean? Yeah. That that's not there. Like no Ghana, even black men. Why, why you cry? Like, why, be a man, be a man and all this stuff. Right. And it is here in North America, but I feel like when it does come to that cultural aspect of what you're saying, the Arabic culture, uh, the, the Ghana culture, the black culture, even the brown culture, it's like, no, nah, that no, your dad will be like, no, you shouldn't be crying. What, what is wrong with you? You know? And, and yeah, I totally agree with that because, um, I remember, uh, same situation, you know, like when playing sports, um, I remember I wasn't paying attention and we were playing baseball and it was due to my vision. I was like, I was right behind, uh, the person that was, uh, up for bat. And he actually, when he was swinging back, he smoked me in the, the, in the forehead. Hey. Right. But like, um, I remember like my teacher running up to me and like automatically assumed like, like she blamed that person mm. and, and, and like, and she blamed it on my vision. She's like, Oh, Ali's visually impaired. You got to be careful mm. when you're playing around him. You know what I mean? Like it was automatically his fault, but at the, at the, at the same time, I'm the one who got too close to him Yeah, and I had enough vision, but like, it just, I, I, that was one of the things too is that that per, that that person got blamed for something he wasn't aware of like he didn't know I was visually impaired at the time like that's what I mean like I, I always wanted to keep it a secret I didn't go out of my way to tell people it was still at the time where I was coping with my disability I remember my teacher seeing it and I I start crying because I took a, a bat to the forehead mm -hmm. and he got blamed for it and he got in trouble and it turned into this big thing um where the parents got involved and stuff, but I felt so bad because it wasn't his fault. Like yeah. I wanted to share blame, but it did like, I'll be honest. I was, I was like 14 at the time. I wasn't going to go out my, out of my way to admit, like it was my fault. Things were already uh, in play and the parents were involved. And then, and, and this, 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 this peer of mine was getting in trouble for something he didn't know. Like he didn't know I was behind him. Like I kind of ran and I put my head yeah. right behind uh, his bat and he was just warming up and, and, you know, it just, it just happened. It was an accident, you know, with mm -hmm. kids, but like just how everything um, unfolded after that was crazy. And, 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 it, and that was one of those lessons you learn where you're like, um, and then my dad got mad at me because I was crying. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. you said, it's just like, no, you got to be a man. You got to be strong. It's like, I took a bat to the forehead. Yeah, it's <laughs> like, like I'm 14. And it's like, almost like half my skull's hanging out from my head. And yo, you're telling me not to cry. You know? <laughs> oh. and, yeah. and it just made me more aware. It was like, I need to be careful. Like, it, yeah. it was the first time I acknowledged I was visually impaired as an individual. Yeah. Because in that situation, I was like, I need to be careful because whatever happens to me, because I have a disability, sometimes that blame is going to be put onto the next person. Yeah, and um, it, it started to interrupt, but it makes me wonder, because you uh, made mention that time you you realized, okay, I'm visually impaired. I have to, to be more careful. And with that said, that's almost a sense of vulnerability. That's a sense of, okay, I'm understanding that I can't do certain things. And vulnerability sometimes that's associated with weakness which is not true but did you ever feel that having to admit that you had sight loss you had to contradict being that tough guy where you you have your dad you have any male in your life being like you have to be tough you you can't ask for help no no like you and then you're visually impaired where you do have to sometimes ask for help right so how did that contradiction feel if you did feel contradicted? I did. And so when I was telling you earlier, I, I came to my senses after I finished high school where I coped with my disability. Mm. But going through that realization was that transformation, you have to be vulnerable for change, 
right? Like when you're always trying to be the tough guy and you have a disability, you, you your mindset and your persona towards life is you don't want to ask questions. You don't want to, you don't want people to help you or guide you or support you, but you become your own barrier essentially mm -hmm. in the life that you want to live. And so I realized that like when all my friends were you know, working these, these jobs where they were getting paid $25 and I was working a job making $8 an hour. Right. I said, school's my, my, my key to, to make that kind of money. Mm. Um, and there was that motivation, but at the same time, I had to figure myself out. I couldn't just go in, um, quote unquote blindly, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. And so I, so what I did was I, I had to do a lot of self-reflecting. I, I, I had to be vulnerable and I had to have conversations with people that, um, that have walked the journey before me. You know mm. what I mean? Like there was, there's like, my brother was, you know, he helped me a lot with coping with my disability and my brother taught me how to be vulnerable. He's like, if, if you're not going to ask questions and, and allow others to help you on your journey, you're not going to make it far. You know what I mean? And that's a lesson he taught me. And, and that's something I had to, to deal with because like you said, my whole life I had to, I was so ashamed of my disability but you know my 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 roots wanted me to be a man they, they wanted me to be that tough guy and mm -hmm. and I couldn't you know be vulnerable but like after me and my brother you know he he went to school and he walked that that journey with vision loss before me he was he honestly he helped me a lot and I would thank God for him because he told me how to be vulnerable. And then once I, I, I coped with my disability and made it a part of my identity and I was able to be vulnerable, I didn't make it my whole identity. Just made it a part of my identity. Right. Yes. And I start seeking help. You know, I start reaching out to individuals on LinkedIn, you know, and then taking information that was given to me by like, you know, my, my counselor at, at post-secondary. And, mm. and I remember my first two cement, uh, semesters were horrible because mm -hmm. I didn't understand what technology I needed to be successful like I would always try to like find the smartest person like that was my approach and then hopefully they would help me but like once you know that the, and then I, I I one of the accessibility advisors like you need the right equipment and so um my brother's like get an iPad and a Mac yes. like, oh man that changed my world like, that, yes that that allow me to build my skills and like understand how important technology was because like when you're in the school or like when you're in post-secondary like a lot of it is is you doing the work you know you can get help but like you need to put in that effort it's not like high school anymore where the teachers will still be running after you kind of thing exactly right? and even it's so many points you highlighted and i'm, I'm just gonna kind of go back on some of the points you made mention the one point I really, really like and love that you brought up is something that I could even relate to as well. Um, men in education, right? Like you have the, the mindset where it's like, oh, to be a real man and even racialized men, they go into the trades, right? They're, they're doing mechanics, electricians, plumbers, fixing stuff up. And sometimes what you even said with your, your buddies making $25 an hour and you were saying you were making that amount and you're like, okay, you know what? I'm going to decide to go to school, which I don't, I don't want to sway any of our listeners, but as a person with sight loss, school is, is important to have those extra credentials, right? Exactly. So, and school teaches you like the skills you need within the for workforce, yeah, how to okay. research, how to be patient, it builds on your communication skills. It allows you to see what technology you need that complements your, your, your eye condition and your skill set to be, to be able to thrive in any environment you're placed in. Yeah, so it and really tests, it tests you as a person to find yourself and find what you need to be successful in certain areas. Of course. And then it proves to employers like, point blank, like there's going to be employers who have assumptions about people with sight loss and misconceptions. But when you could say, I have this bachelor, I have this degree, I have this diploma, I have whatever, you're kind of proving to them, okay, you know what, I do have sight loss, but I have the credentials to back it up. You know what I mean? Exactly. And, um, and, and like, honestly, school does more for an individual than they know. 
Right? Yes. Especially with, with vision loss. Like all my skills that I have today and that I've built on uh, throughout uh, working at CNIB was because uh, going through those experiences at school, you know what I mean? Like sitting down with an accessibility advisor, they don't know what your accommodations you need. You need to talk it out. You know what I mean? You need to talk with your teachers of to guarantee your success. Like this, this is where I'm having trouble. Can you help me? Right. Um, and exactly. the worst thing they could say to you is no, but it's, it really shows what you're capable of, uh, of as an individual. How far are you willing to go to fulfill your dreams? And I'll be honest with you. There was like to complete an essay. Sometimes I would see my friend and he have it done in two days. Oh, like his I research, hated that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, his research would be done in a day yep. and he would have it done the next day. It was just, it just, and, and honestly, a lot of it is because. He, he was fully sighted. I yeah. had to, I had to large things at eight times and get zoom text to read things, search Google scholar, and then the library mm -hmm. uh, website mm -hmm. that wasn't really, you know, accessible at the time, you know, mm -hmm. zoom text. Mm -hmm. and they just that. highlight through one page of a uh, article and they get the information. You have to go through everything and re-listen to everything. So I know <laughs> hands down. Yes. I, ah, it just gives me like, yeah, <laughs> shivers right now thinking about that whole process. Uh, a question I, I want to ask you, and I, I know I keep jumping back in your story. No worries. Bro. And even just in general, like just men racialized. You made mention, I, I believe you made mention on sometimes compensation for, for that vulnerability of having sight loss. Mm -hmm. So even an example for myself, I remember in high school, yeah, I used to try and dress tough, you know what I mean? I try to be tough, like the pants, you know, the cap, the whatever. I guess people would say I try to dress like a thug, right? Because I knew with my sight loss, I had to somehow like compensate and be like, okay, I'm still tough. I'm still a tough guy. Did you ever have to experience that in any way, shape or form? Oh, yeah. There was one time in, in grade 10, um, I got into a fight. And, and uh, it was like, uh, you know, the school I went to wasn't the greatest. Yeah. So, uh, very, the probably the worst part of Calgary. I went there. Um, and uh, yeah, there was like a full out brawl in the rotunda, I remember? And I took a, I took a baton to the nose. Mm. You know what Shoot. I mean? And yeah. I remember I didn't even want to be a part of it. I was, I was scared. Uh, I'm not going to yeah. lie to you. But my friends, they're like, oh, you know, they, they start calling me names and stuff. And I got involved. Like I said, sometimes, you know, you got to be aware of your surroundings. The first two steps I, I took in, in into that fight, I took a, a, a baton to the nose. Mm. And I broke my nose, I remember. And I was, you know, it, it, it's, it's, yeah, you know what I mean? That sometimes you had to have that tough persona because at the end of the day, you were scared of being vulnerable. You were scared of people seeing seeing that you're visually impaired, like from my experience, I was always scared of people finding out and not accepting me for who I am. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought it was just like a, I just, I, I just di didn't want people to know, but it was so obvious. Like you'd look at me and my eyes would be looking the other way. Yeah. You know, something was up and it would, it would, dis it, it would, it, it would disclose that I was visually impaired from the get go. You know, yeah. people, you know, people, you know, in, in high school used to call me crazy eyes. Like I, I see through my peripheral. So I'll like, I'll tip my face to the side to, to see more detail from the corner of my eye. And people always used to be like, they would call me crazy eyes and stuff like that. And, it, and that stuff hurt, but like, I'd rather them just call me that than not actually know that I'm visually impaired yeah. or know what I actually have. And that brings up something so interesting as well. So we're talking about, I guess, this racialized masculinity and kind of uh, being a man from our perspective, whereas you being, um, Middle Eastern, me being a, a black man, it was almost where my eyes did go everywhere, right? So to the general public, it's like, yo, just like you, crazy eyes. And I still remember being going to Toronto once and I was with a bunch of friends and they kind of went ahead of me and I, I walked very slow. I didn't use a cane at that time, right? So I was just walking, observing Toronto. And I remember it was these two, two black dudes. And I was looking at one of the guy's shirts. And I was like, that's a really nice shirt because it was all graffiti. And not knowing, my friend had to tell me after, they were following me. They wanted to fight me because they thought I was giving them a dirty look. 
But I think because I was nonchalant about that, like, whoa, this guy's crazy. <laughs> He's not reacting, you know what I mean? So, like, it's those experiences that you're making mention where people sort of fear you too. They don't want to say, oh, like, maybe he has sight loss or is something wrong. They just kind of assume, like, yo, look at this guy trying to be tough or whatever. Yeah. I'm not messing with this guy. He's this, this, and this, you know? It was, you know, and, and I, I totally, yeah, like in grade 10 and 11, I tried to have that persona, you know, yeah. the tough guy. It wasn't until grade 12 is until I kind of finally got my act together because I was like on the verge of not walking the stage and graduating. Mm. And that scared me. Like, go, like in my head, the way my parents would like, don't go to school for 13 years and not graduate. And like, that was always embedded in me at a young age like you need to graduate high school because like I remember like a high school diploma back in the day early you know back in the day was like it was it was it was highly regarded in my culture for some reason like if you if you went to high school and graduated you were probably like one of the smartest individuals within the community like I remember it was taken like that and so um my parents made it seem like if I didn't graduate then I would bring shame to them and it was just it was an element of being a male too that they wanted to 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 say oh yeah my son graduated mm. you know it was it was it was it was it was one of those things on that checklist i mentioned that i i had to accomplish for me to be a man within my culture it's just, yeah i could yeah <laughs> it's it's those things for sure for sure man uh, so i have a another question i didn't don't want to fully veer away from like education and role models and experiences, but relationship wise, you being a racialized male, how was that kind of with that role of I have to be a man when I'm in a relationship? Has, was that ever something that you had to deal with? Or? No, like, yeah, you know, playing that part to a certain degree. I think my biggest issue is actually like my my vision loss you know what i mean like mm. it's not like it was it was it was being visually impaired was in any relationship was it was a big part but it and, and like you said there are elements at first when you're getting to know someone um especially like i remember like i would get to know you know certain uh women from my 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 that were were arab yes and like the the, the way they grew up is kind of the way, the same way I grew up is that you want to find someone that can support you. Right. And so once they like in every relationship, once they figured out I was visually impaired, that was always the issue. It's like, he's, he's defective. Mm-hmm. I don't know how he's going to support me. Right. So it was always that vision loss that was like, okay, a man has to be a man. But before it even got to that point, of me proving myself, my vision loss was the, old, the, the thing that would always come into play. Mm-hmm. Who's going to drop me off at the grocery store? Who's, you know what I mean? And those questions are always asked. So it was always like, you know, having a conversation about my vision loss and how if we were to move forward in a relationship, how are you going to support us? How are you going to be a man? And then that's when those questions would come into play. Yeah, and that's great example like even like i was making mention in the ghana and the black culture it's like uh, when are you going to come pick me up you know what i mean and and i find even dating someone who who does have sight loss you have that urge of okay when they're on the same level as you too and they experience sight loss you have that urge of like i gotta be a man still i gotta protect you you know what i mean because it's been so embedded in us by a culture where it's like the man has to do this, the man has to be this, the man has to to be the protector, mm-hmm. that you you start to <laughs> kind of get lost in it again, right? I, I don't know about you though. I, I 100% agree. But yeah. like in my experience, it was, it was, I always had that mindset. I need to support, you know, if I want a family, if I want a relationship, yeah. I need to be able to, to play that role as a man, you know, but the the biggest thing was like before I can even get to those conversations or even think that I was capable of doing that for someone, um, it was always my vision loss that was always at the forefront. Yeah, you know, yeah. What I mean? I, and 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 I, you know, any relationship I've ever been in before, you know, I always had that element like I want to be the man and this and that, but 
before I can have conversations to explain how things would be if we proceeded, it was always with my vision. Yeah. The downside. Like, how are you going to do this? How are we going to do this? How are we going to do this? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it would get to the point, how are you going to play with your kids? And it's just, to me, it's the, it's, it's people just getting overwhelmed and not, and they're not willing to educate themselves on the matter. But it would always, they would be always thinking like, how about this happen? How about this happen? And it always didn't end well. It would always lead to the point where this person doesn't accept me as a whole because my Mm. vision loss is a part of my identity. That always came second though. Like, you know, being able to provide because I, I didn't have a chance to ever explain how I would go about it. Yeah. Well, even with that, sometimes that even psychs you out from getting to that point of planning how I'm going to be, to be the man, right? Yeah. Because even looking back, hindsight 2020, looking back was sometimes in society, we have these expectations of what, what a man is like. And even in our, our cultures, we're embedded what a man is like, right? But sometimes, just like we were saying with vulnerability, sometimes it doesn't even matter. Sometimes showing your vulnerability doesn't make you any less of a man or any, in my case, a black man, in your case, a Middle Eastern yeah, male, I right? Totally agree with that, yeah. So it, it's just such an interesting concept that and even shout out to like the young people who are listening to this. I, I really hope that you're able to l- learn from these experiences of me and Ali because it's like, Education is important. Uh, being vulnerable is important. You don't necessarily have to be the tough guy because guess what? You're the tough guy. Yeah, just one strike and, and you go flying and you don't see it coming, right? So sometimes you just have to step away. You know what I mean? So that kind of leads me into the next question, Ali. So what advice would you have for, for young men who grew up in the same culture and religion as yourself? What would you give them? I would say be true to yourself, be willing to, to be vulnerable, you know, and, and if someone's going to help you, let them in, you know, ask questions because everybody, it doesn't matter for all the billionaires in the world, whether it's, you know, Bill Gates, um, Elon Musk, they all had mentors and asked questions to get to the point they've reached right and and you need to be able to 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 cope with your disability make it a part of your identity and being and 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 be willing to go that extra mile and to live that life you want but there ha that work has to be done you know you can't go from zero to 100 real fast you need to enjoy the ride there right you need to enjoy that 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 in between and i think a lot of people forget that because they're life gets the best of them within the culture there's certain things they need to um accomplish you know you got to be a man you got to buy a house and stuff but you know like i say like it's your life at the end of the day Mm. enjoy that moment and enjoy that transformation the the alley i was in 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 10 years ago is not the alley that's on this podcast you know what i mean there Mm. there has that i've evolved over the years and I've reached a point where I want to advocate and build awareness around vision loss, you know, to, to, to make change, to, to have these, these dialogues. So, you know, like I said, is, is being, be willing to be vulnerable and, 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 and cope with your disability. And I'm not saying that it's going to happen overnight, but work on it. And eventually mm-hmm. you'll learn to accept yourself and love yourself and, and move forward. Lee, uh, Lee, wise man, wise words from a wise man. You're poetic too. Wow. I try, I try, I try. <laughs> I, I love it, but honestly, you got to make an album. You know what I mean? I, I need someone to beatbox in the background. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get Kia. There we go. Because yeah, I, yeah. I beatbox it. But know what? That's besides the point. Uh, Lee, we are running out of time. And I just want to say, Thank you so much for your insight, man. Honestly, I'm so glad I, I reached out to you for this episode. Awesome. Thank you for having me, Ben. And I, I really appreciate it. I love building awareness around the community. And if, if my journey can help someone, some individual with, with vision loss out, 
I'm, I'm happy, you know, even if it's one person, if they can relate, it's great. What a great conversation that I had with Ali. It was good to highlight those barriers and those, those issues for individuals who do live with sight loss and who are racialized males because it's uh, a different scope. Uh, so I really enjoyed uh, our conversations. I hope to get him back on the show one day. And if you like today's episode, don't be afraid. Press subscribe and you could get notifications to uh, any new episode that is coming out on any of your preferred platforms. And then also, if you like the conversation of diversity and inclusion and intersectionality in regards to sight loss, please visit the CNIB website. And we have a diversity and inclusion page with a bunch of resources. It also has a podcast and many videos that you can explore. So uh, once again, thank you for tuning in to The Lens Living Diverse. I was your host, Ben, and you have a fabulous day. Peace. <laughs>